So, welcome everybody to yet another live interview with the Cabo Fearless Father. And we are going all the way to France with David. Hey, Thank how you so doing? On, David. <laughs> I and, love and, and in location. Good morning to you. How you doing? Look, see where I am? Look, yeah. I brought you to cognac. Amazing. You see the flag? That's Hennessy. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yep, absolutely. I appreciate you taking us out there. It's always a lot of fun to watch this. People that are listening to the replay on podcast, sorry, you can't see how cool this looks. So check it out on YouTube oh. as well. <laughs> yeah, anyway, you, check it, you check it out on YouTube. It's a great place. <laughs> yeah, it looks awesome, man. It's got to be fantastic living there, spending your time there. I'm just, I'm just looking behind me. We've got people swimming in the river right now. <laughs> oh, for real? Yeah, <laughs> that's nuts. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So before we go into your origin story, because I'm very excited to get to know more about you, David. I got yeah. a question, man, because um, I had another father on this show whose mm -hmm. son had, and I got to think real hard, ADHD and something else that I can't remember. Something also okay. different than mainstream, you know, what we all think. Yeah regular so let's start with that explain for the people that do not know what does it mean for a kid and then later we dive in what it means for a parent but what does it mean for a kid to have dyslexia oh well, that's a great question you know um i've done a i've done a lot of asking a lot of questions and you know my son's five and a half years old and uh, he doesn't have a dyslexia but what got me into that is my son developed a squint at nine months old and it's created him problems at school. And having spoken to other dyslexic people when they were growing up and dyslexic and dyslexic children, it's like this, right? But when you have a, a visual handicap, not everybody can recognize that you've got a visual handicap. It's more obvious with my son because obviously it's a squint, you know, so his eyes lazy. But mm. um, you, he, fe he felt frustrated that he couldn't not just keep up with the stuff in class. He's, he's an intelligent little boy and you know, all little kids, all little boys and little girls, they want to do really well at school. And then all of a sudden they can't and they're being hampered and they're being held back. And, and it's not their fault and it's not the school's fault, um, but they feel frustrated because they can't do things that, uh, that their, their friends are doing. Um, yep. they, they, they can't make the progress. And because of that frustration kicks in and embarrassment as well. Mm. Um, I know. I know. For one, my son was embarrassed. Uh, he told us, and um, which is which, which is pretty clever, really, for a four-year-old to understand what embarrassment was and, and actually uh, explain that. But he felt frustrated and he felt embarrassed, and because of that, um, he's not the sort of type of guy, um, uh, boy, uh, to sit back in the class and be quiet. That's not his personality. He doesn't do that. So what he did is he became disruptive, and he became disruptive to hide his well, um, his his issues, the deficiency, his problem, or whatever you want to call it. So that caused him problems at school. They didn't like that, um, obviously, because it's been disruptive to the class. And yeah. um, we didn't quite understand why he was being disruptive. We really didn't pick, you know, really didn't pick the two together, even though he has an obvious squint. And this is not dyslexia, where dyslexia gets picked up in later life tends tends to. But we worked it out. But before then. He was getting told off and get, he was getting disciplined at school. And then he came back home for, and we found out that he was being a bad boy. So what did we do? We disciplined him. So he was getting disciplined like 24 hours a day, um, uh, really because he was reacting in a certain way because of his frustration and his embarrassment, the fact that he couldn't do the things that other kids were doing. And so that's how he felt. And then once we realized what was going off, oh, wow, did, 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 we, feel, did we feel guilty? <laughs> Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, it's 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 really hard. You know, it's I think every child wants to do well at school. Every every child likes to please their, their teacher and their parents. And then you've got the situation where they can't. They held back. Um, and with Amelia, and that's the name of my son having a squint. So it's a little bit different with dyslexia. With dyslexia, your words jumbled up and what have you not. The squint, he has a lazy eye. So that actually affected him with other different types of skills as well. So sports, for example, he didn't really want to catch a ball, um, didn't like walking upstairs or downstairs because there was a balance issue. Um, and then there's like the fine motor skills. So actually holding a pen and, and doing some, you know, doing some drawing or, you know, filling in with, you know, the crayons, you know, just 
just filling in the lines and stuff like that. Didn't want to do it. He couldn't hold a pen properly because everything was out. Everything was skew with for him. And um, so it's not as if like where some people go, all oh, right, okay, so I, I struggle to read and write. I'll excel in, uh, I'll excel in other stuff. He was, he was getting hit all around, I'm afraid. He was, he was having a real bad time of it. That's crazy. <laughs> so, and yeah. then especially that, you know, he's already frustrated, right? Yeah. And then because he's frustrated, he acts out. Because he acts out, he gets disciplined. So he gets more frustrated. Yeah, got it. And then he comes home, yeah. he gets more disciplined. So he gets more frustrated. And then it's just, you know, one big loop. I'm glad you guys discovered it and then took some separate action, which you're going to talk about in a little bit. You know, what, what were the kind of yeah. things you did? Because I'm assuming you would have had to work again with his confidence to get it, you know, to a level, right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the first, the confidence though came because we understood him and we communicated that. We were very lucky with um, his teacher in um, mm. what you would call second second grade. So, you know, really young. And, uh, but his teacher, she, she, she said, look, I've been with your son now since September, we're in December, and uh, your son has some uh, issues that my son, my eldest son has and went through. And uh, she recommended uh, different types of um, therapy for him. Um, I always struggle with one of the words, kin kinesiology. I always struggle to pronounce that goddamn word. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, so she put us in contact with a few people and and that opened it up to us. We now started to talk to people where they were saying, look, he has an issue and this is how it's affecting him. So simply because we could level with him and say, look, we've made, we actually said to him, look, we've made some mistakes by disciplining you. We shouldn't have done that. And um, we didn't realize what you were going through. And, and, and just by him understanding that we're on his team and that we're there to support him and that we recognize he's got an issue, his confidence actually increased and, 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 we, we then took him to um, uh, two different types of people, that, um, three different types of people, uh, the kinesiologist, um, which I, I don't really want to go into uh, simply because uh, that's, if you don't know anything about it, it looks like voodoo on the outside. Mm. And if I hadn't known, if I hadn't known what it was, I would have thought it was voodoo. But <laughs> some, some stuff happened there that was absolutely magic and it's very personal to him. Um, but the, um, but then he, uh, we, uh, we use a, a child psychologist and mm -hmm. uh, that helped him with his behavior and his understanding of things and even small things such as table manner, you know. Um, so he wanted to eat his food with his, uh, with, his, with his hands. And we were saying, you don't eat with your hands, you know. If you sh he was young, so they, they, they have little fork, little spoon, little knife, you know, they try little stuff. <laughs> but he's heating with his hands, and we didn't understand why. And it was because he couldn't control the knife and fork and spoon in the way that he wanted to. So the psychologist, on, on this one example, was explaining to him the importance of it and why we're, we're sharing that. He started to understand. And then the third person that comes into this, the uh, psychometrician. So psychologist that works in fine motor, fine motor details. She was helping him with the crayon, the pen, the knife and the fork, with a bit of psychology wrapped in. And then you've got the psychologist there working on, the, um, uh, uh, on his behavior, um, getting him to understand emotions mm -hmm. because he was very clouded with his emotions, didn't understand them because emotions were kicking in when they shouldn't have been kicking in. Out of frustration and um, just being disorientated with everything. So they taught him um, uh, uh, emotions and how to handle emotions. And at the same time, we were learning as well. It was an incredible journey. Um, mm -hmm. one, that, one, I have to say that as much as I don't like the pain of that my wife and I and our son went through, I'm actually grateful for it because it made us better parents and I have a better understanding. And... I feel that it will help uh, Emilian's confidence. What he can see now is he has a problem and he doesn't have to bang his head against the wall with that problem. He, his confidence should be supported, in my opinion. We'll see as time goes. 
by the fact that he now knows that if you have an issue, you can speak to somebody about it and get a strategy for it and therefore overcome it. And I, and I do believe that some people lack confidence when uh, they hit a brick wall and they can't find a way around it. Well, Emilian's hit quite a severe brick wall and mm-hmm. has been able to overcome it. So uh, I think moving forward, um, we'll see. Uh, will he become a problem solver? Uh, like his mum and dad, we both, we, we both, both so solve problems in our work. Uh, will he become like that? I don't know, but there, there are things in place that are very, very significant to him. And um, it's interesting actually sitting back and seeing, you know, he's five and a half, six, six years ago, people were saying children will change your life. And he's, he's our only child. I, I, I just can't describe to you how true that statement is. Um, mm-hmm. Partly because they're going to, <laughs> you have no choice. But there's also this other side of it where you can really open up and accept that change and that desire to change. And it's made me a better human being, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Glad to hear it. I appreciate you sharing that as well before we dive into your own story. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, you got me more questions. I just want to highlight something that I find very important <laughs> because. This is okay. important for any parent, right? That I picked up from you just sharing that is make sure you understand your child, right? You yeah. kind of had to, right? Because there was a situation going on, you couldn't figure it out. So you kind of had to. But it kind of seems yeah. like regular parents are just like, no, not regular parents, excuse me. Just, you know. I understand. Just a normal kid, then you don't, you know, it's just everything flows instead of now you sharing yeah. it. It's like, look. Any parent must try to really understand their kids, right? Communicate with them, level with them, as you said, right? Which is very yeah. important. And make it understand that, look, I'm on your team, right? That's right. We, we, we're in this together. So I really appreciate that you sharing that. And I just want to iterate that or mention that real quick to all of our fellow dampeners that are listening and are really blessed. Well, we're all blessed, but that, that don't have these kind of challenges. Well, man, you got to do this anyway. It's, it's like I can, I can, I can. You're right, and I can add to that as well because Amelie, my wife, and I, um, we recognize this. Um, it was only two nights ago. He'd gone to bed, and she was in the kitchen. She was just tidying up. And I went in there and I said, "Hey, can you know we have a couple of minutes about Amelia?" And she said, "Yeah, what's up?" And I identified this little minor issue mm-hmm. um, and then we just started talking going, right, okay, so how do we look into this? Is this the right thing? And, and we're monitoring it. You know, we're working as a team with him. He doesn't actually recognize what we're doing there. But we're not going with that flow that maybe most parents do. We've been put into a situation and we're able to use that situation where, I mean, are we going to be perfect parents? I, I don't think anybody is. But we have this thing where we can start to spot issues mm-hmm, and have mm-hmm. a conversation, have a conversation about it. So one of the issues actually talking about was um, I'm English. You can hear me speak in English. We live in France. My wife is French. So therefore the maternal language, not only does he live in France, but his maternal language is French. So he's fluent in mm-hmm. French. Um, he's not great at talking in English. Yeah. Uh, well, I say understand everything for a, as a five-year-old would do, you know. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh. But we've, <clears throat> you know, you know, we're identifying. Okay, how's this going to look in the next few years? Because my French is not particularly great. I'm just not a language person. Maybe I'm, I'm putting a bad barrier there in front of me. Hey, who knows? But I do try my best to speak in French to him, but not to the level where I can ask him a question and carefully listen to his reply. Now I work in sales and marketing, business development, and, and questions are king, you know. And and, and, and um, reflective listening. And, and, I, and I don't have that. And the, the, the issue that I raised with my wife the other night is, where's he gonna put his onus on this in the future? Because some of our jobs cannot be 50-50. And I would like that to be 50-50. I'd like to have more, control's not the word for it. Um, involvement is the word for it. But I'm just wondering, and I'm saying to Amelie, how's this gonna, how's this gonna come out in a few years time? Will he will he is mm-hmm. but we're just looking at the, the, the dynamics in our family. Maybe we're looking in too much detail sometimes. We don't mind, 
you, you went through. It, it, it brings things into sharp focus and, you know, okay, so my, my language skills with him aren't so great. Amelie's language skills are absolutely spot on. So therefore, how could that change his world? And it's stuff like that. And you know what? It's a pain, but it's a happy pain to have. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I know where you're coming from. <laughs> As a Dutch guy living in Spain with a Spanish uh, wife, um, I, I have difficulty with, yeah, what you mentioned, like the big challenges, the, the um, born conversation, not the just day-to-day chit-chat -day and stuff like that. You know, it doesn't matter if you speak Spanish, French, um, English, yeah. whatever language you do with your kids, right? They, they understand. But once you go a level deeper, right, where it gets really important for both father and son, that's, yeah, I can yeah. understand where you're coming from. That's where I'm struggling a little bit as well. That's why we're working a lot on languages. Uh, so they speak now three languages or understand three languages, as you say, like understand the English as well. And now we're working on speaking. So yeah, that's, that would be my thing to you is like, just keep focusing on the English as well. So he becomes, uh, you know, at least bilingual because it's, well, if he would speak French, yeah, it, English, that for later on is absolutely gold. So great, man. That's a nice, <laughs> nice little chance to have. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I'm not complaining. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, so, David, let's, uh, man, we were 16 minutes in. We haven't even talked about you. <laughs> uh, David, share with us real quick, man. What's your origin story? Who's David? We, we heard already you're married to Emily, who's from France. You're living in France. You're actually English. Yeah. And you got a five and a half year old son. But share a little bit more about your background. How did, how did that happen? Well, you look, you're breaking up a little. I think I understand yeah. your question. You're just asking me about my background and uh, you're asking me how I got into my business. I think that's what you're asking. So um, I, I dropped out of school. Uh, no, I didn't drop out of school. That's wrong. I failed school. Um, I had a lot of issues there. Left school with zero qualifications, kind of like messed around for a few years, going to college between 16 and 19. Picked up a couple of qualification. Nothing, nothing spectacular, nothing great. Went into the workplace, couldn't really do anything. I didn't want to work in a factory, that's not for me. So I just kind of found myself in working in sales, selling newspaper advertising, um, because uh, for some reason I didn't mind getting rejected. Um, maybe I, I had a lot of rejection anyway in my life, nothing to do with my father or to do with women. <laughs> Get a girlfriend. Um, I, was I was pretty good on handling rejection. You get used to it. So uh, working in sales, um, phoning companies up, see if they want to advertise in a newspaper. That, that was no deal. <laughs> um, having a girl reject you, saying that she's not interested, that could be hard. Having somebody say, no, we don't, we don't want to spend advertising with you. That was, that was easy. Um, so I kind of fell into sales and uh, into recruitment sales. And uh, I started making some okay cash. Nothing spectacular, but I was earning more than my friends and, and stuff like that. And I, I got to 25 and I thought, there's, there's calling for me. I, I really need to get a university. So uh, I found a, I got in touch with this university, found them up, told them about my background, went down there for an interview, and uh, I sold myself uh, to get in there with so very little qualifications. And um, that's where I met my wife. Um, I got myself a degree, um, did a pretty decent degree actually, um, but left knowing full well that degree was. <laughs> It will always be useless for me in my life. I've never used it. Mm. Um, I guess business management, but I never, I never used it to get a job or anything like that. And um, Amelie and I were due to marry now in 2008. And she said, hey, look, you know, um, if we get married, it means I want children or, or a child at least. And um, it means living in France is diabolical. What are you going to do about it? So... Um, I started to research into that sort of stuff and uh, I ended up working online. I went to an internet marketing conference. I think it was 2007, I think it was. We got married in 2008 and um, went to this conference, came back looking for a niche market. Couldn't find a niche market for six months. And um, I was doing some work for a friend of mine, a bit of a, a friend, business mentor, employer. Um, his name's Nick and he said hey David I'm 
doing some sales training down at the car dealership. Um, can you can you come with me? And uh, can you do some facilitation? I went, yeah, sure, cool. What are we doing? And uh, we had to do lead gen. So we're doing some lead generation, uh, ringing up different types of company on how they could bring in people to buy cars from us. So it's like a lead gen based on referrals. And um, the sales team were um, hitting a brick wall. Um, they were ringing in drive schools, actually. And uh, these driving schools were saying they're not interested. And I'm thinking, what the hell? You know, why are your driving schools not interested in making some free money? Couldn't work it out. Uh, so I, here's me. I'm trying to think, how can I build a business so I can go abroad uh, uh, to France? And then I get presented with this gift of these driving schools not interested in business. So I did some research. I found out about their, um, as, as you would know, as an avatar now, just doing some digging about their background, where yeah. they're from, why they're driving schools, what's their, what's their pain, what's their ambition, what are their issues in their business. And I found out a whole host of information. So I thought, hey, you know what? Actually, I can cure this problem because I love sales and marketing and their biggest issue is sales and marketing. So um, I did some more research and I wrote an ebook. And I used to sell that for thirty-seven dollars, no, thirty-seven pounds, which is about fifty-five dollars, just a PDF. And uh, started to pull it out. Um, it wasn't giving me a full salary, um, but it certainly gave us more than enough for Amelie to come over to France and get mm. a job interview, that job, and for, for them for, us, for me to come over. And um, for ten years, I've been concentrated in this niche, supporting driving schools. And as a lot of these driving instructors tell me, say, hey, David, how do marketing for us when you've never been a driving instructor? And a lot of them have been saying that for such a long time. And I actually thought, hey, you know what? That's a really good skill to have. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've always kind of like kept that in the back of my mind. How can I go into it um, without actually knowing that niche? You know, how can you help electricians if you're not an electrician? Now, uh, for me, I know the answer, but a lot of people actually within the niche, they, they, they don't always see it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I bring my skills in. If you want my skills, then my skills are there and I'll help you. But um, bring it really up to date because I'm, I'm still heavily involved with that. My next step uh, is working with dyslexic families because one of the great things, I think it's great, is I can make money online. I've helped other people make money online. And some people think, oh, I make $10,000 a month. Um, and I'm thinking, you don't need to make $10,000 a month to make a change. What if you only make five, what if you only make 500 US dollars a month, right? And so park that idea there. What if you only make $100 a week, $500 a month? It's a bit of a part-time. You're playing around on your computer. You're making a bit of uh, cash coming in. That's cool. I could pay for something. So now you look at my son and his issue with his squint and the pressure that it put on Amelie and I. Two great things helped us. One had a little bit more income than let's say the average uh, Joe public would have and the second thing is because I work from home I had time so therefore I wasn't restricted uh, working nine till five or anything and that some of that time I could spend more of that time with Amelia and I'm thinking well the pressures on us right now with our son are really hard and and I got thinking geez there could be other families out there that are not doing as well as we are they're, they're suffering more because they don't have the resources that we've got and um, it just so happens with the driving school industry they're starting to talk about dyslexia and things like that and i'm thinking wow um uh, this this could be something and then i find out that 20 percent of uh, all people uh, have a level of dyslexia many of which uh, is actually unrecognized so i'm thinking crap you know if, if that's the case i'm thinking about all those parents that are going through the issues and looking after their son or uh, son or daughter and wishing that they had some extra money and the bottom line is really when your kid goes through school and they've got problems the number one solution is to be able to give them a better education that could be going to private school yeah you know, like taking them out it could be some home tutor you know it could be homeschooling or we could actually be bringing in a private tutor like three hours a week four hours a week something like that and this way it come, ties back into like making money online because I know that I can help anybody make $100 a week. Uh, that's, that's easy. Uh, um, $100 a week, what does that get you? That probably gets you a private tutor for three or four hours. And, and I think with, with families, 
uh, that have got dyslexia in that family, that child suffering, if they had a private tutor three or four hours a week, <laughs> I think that would change everything. Well, it would change many things. So I kind of created the Dyslexic Adventure back in uh, August and it's, it's going slow at the moment because I'm, I, I've got a lot of research to do. I'm, I'm going to Sweden in September for an international conference on dyslexia. But I've already been picked up by somebody who wants me to have my own TV, not TV program, uh, uh, to have my own TV channel, a whole channel. And um, they, they want me to have that on uh, Amazon and Apple and Roku. So uh, nice. I bumped into them in February. Yeah, I'm really excited. So I've got a lot, a lot of planning to do. Because we, we, we met in February, uh, a lady called Angie Norris. And uh, Angie said, hey, you know, this is what I do. Could you be interested in the future? And I said, look, I don't really know. Um, let's keep in touch. And then she just gets in touch with me. She says, hey, David, this dyslexic adventure that you're doing, you must have this TV channel. I must help you. We must do something together because it's the positive effect that you're going to have. And um, so we're just in the, the beginning of uh, planning that. So the idea is for raise awareness, um, help people Id uh, identify um, the issues and I don't think I'm going to call it dyslexia in the future I think I'm just going to call it difficulties with reading and writing and learning um, so I think people can um, um, be a little bit more closer to that um, mm. rather than placing a condition on their head we'll see mm -hmm. and um, yeah if, if I can raise if I can raise awareness and then give tools out to parents and and uh, so they can stand on their own two feet a little bit more. I mean, they don't have to take it. They don't have to do it. But if I can help them and uh, help their kids, then uh, that's the path that I'm on. Love it. Uh, I always love the fact that the more live interviews I do, the more guys I get on the show, the more, the better I get at picking guys out like you that, you know, want to make a huge impact in the life of their sons. But at the same time, we appreciate the life of as well. That's so important. It resonates with me. So that we're on this call and you, you're sharing in regards to this life of the adventure. All that are watching, uh, in the comment section, I put the link to the website of David. You can check it out. And um, yeah, connect with him through that. He already mentioned that he's going to take it in the future. However, now we to go. Anyway, between the winds and that in Spain being horrible, uh, we're trying to make this thing work. <laughs> yeah, I'm struggling to hear you, but I think some of the things that you were saying there is uh, my message that I'm giving out through my story. Um, mm. I, I, I would have never imagined myself doing this a few years ago, but um, uh, it's, it's opportunity really, isn't it? Colliding with preparation. Um, I have skills in my life. I see this opportunity and then you can help other people and you know I've always liked helping other people I love it but it's really better if it comes from the heart if that makes sense um, mm -hmm. where you can and you can really talk about your story and your journey and you know it does does dyslexia no is it an exact path no is it very similar yeah are the pressures the same god damn it they are um, is it hard? yeah does it put pressure does it help other people if you start talking about it? Yeah, it does. Um, mm. Should other people talk about it? I'd like to think so. And uh, can I can I at least provide an opportunity? <coughs> excuse me, for other people to look at. No, I mean, they don't have to watch my TV channel when it's up and running. Um, they don't have to engage with my website. It's their choice. But if I could provide that opportunity, so people can just maybe look at things in a different way, then um, I'm happy with that. Yeah, I love it, man. I absolutely. I actually written a little semicircle, just lines, because when you shared about your story, it seemed like every single time it was in regards to a different thing that was happening to you that you saw as an opportunity. You grabbed it, ran with it, and turned it into something that worked for you and made it work in the way that you want it. Right? Makes you go. To Get the opportunity to go to France yeah. and there with your wife and your and and, and have a son, etc. Uh, etc. Et right? So, um, I think that's a great. Message well, Klaus, here's the thing you're absolutely right. 
I've been looking for opportunity. You know what? I've been looking with my head. And that was the problem. Actually, I found some really good opportunities that I've been help, able to have a, a significant help in. But when I went to university, uh, I put myself in a position where there's no pressure on me or anything like that. I, I wasn't looking for a girlfriend. I just knew that she would come. I just needed to put myself in the right best possible place to be you know, the most attractive person. And I'm not talking about going down to the gym, wearing fancy clothes and stuff like that. I'm talking about the most attractive person I can be from my personality. And I'm just genuinely looking after myself. And she came along. And then, you know, I've been looking for other challenges, other, other opportunities, and I've been forcing about, and I have. And um, it was funny because I went to, um, I don't know if you're into click funnels, Funnel Hacking Live. I went to Funnel Hacking Live in February. And mm. uh, I met two people. One, one person I knew I was going to meet, a guy called Rob Yates, who's become my business mentor. And mm. uh, another a great guy, uh, Patrick Rurker, who's a therapist. And um, they work with me uh, to try and move my thinking away from my brain, the logical sort of stuff, and actually move it into my heart. Mm. And, and as I was doing that, these opportunities started to come clearer and obvious. And um, I just know they're the right thing. I mean, Rob Yates, my business mentor, he said, David, you know what? Dyslexia is not perfect for you because you've not gone through that journey yourself. Um, but it's a really bloody good fit from a parental point of view. And he's right. Uh, he's absolutely right. And at the moment, I call it dyslexic. I don't know it's in the future. This could be the ADHD adventure or, 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 or whatever. But it, it's parent, son. There are other things happening in my life right now around me where I've got friends over the last two, three years. They're getting divorced. Um, some mm. of them are not seeing their kids. You know, they're being held back where they only see their son you know, in every 14 days. And I... I've really developed this kind of like social consciousness of being a dad and what it means to be a dad, what it means to be a boy or a daughter um, and um, what it means to be a parent, quite patriarchal because I see my friends are splitting up and they've got issues and it seems to be the dad that always gets the rough end of the stick. It's not 50-50, mm -hmm. they're not helping each other out and it seems to be the dad that sees the ch child less and that's, that's really resonating with me. I mean... Thankfully, I've never gone through anything like that. But then I'm starting to see it from a parent point of view. And it's just, it's, it's just all this like gathering of this, I don't know what you would call it, gathering of consciousness around me. It just makes me feel so much better. But for me to get on that road, I had to get a mentor. I had to get a mentor coach, a bloody good one, you know. Um, I know Americans like the word bloody, so I'll, I'll drop a few bloodies in every uh, again. I see it's very, very English. Um, so Rob's, Rob's amazing. He, he, he's been down the journey for me. He knows where I want to go in the future. Mm. Um, it's, you know, I'm the, you know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm driving the, I'm driving the car here, but, uh, he's giving me the, the map, you know, where we're going. There's dead end down that road, David, or that's, a, that's, that's a quicker road to take, you know, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And with Patrick Roker, it, with Patrick, he just helped me feel more at ease with myself and more comfortable with myself. So this is not just about business. It's, it's a lot of it is about self-awareness and if i hadn't have taken that self-awareness journey i wouldn't speak i wouldn't be speaking with you right now um i wouldn't be going to uh, sweden to attend a, an international conference on dyslexia and there is no way on this earth i would have been offered the opportunity like the way i have to create my own tv channel exactly. um and it's actually really what i want klaus because you know, you, you hear business development gurus, marketing gurus, um, drop a few names like Gary V and, and um, um, Tony Robbins. You know, they say, follow your heart, follow your, you know, follow your real passion. And, and I never really knew what my heart was or what my passion was, but I did, but I never actually squared up to it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even if it was sitting in front of my face and I'm just refusing it. I have an ego. I like being on stage. If only I could play the guitar, if only I could sing. I would do that because mm. I love going out there and I love, I like showing off saying, look at me, but I like being up front and I like people seeing me. And when Tony Robbins says, Hey, you know, who are you? What do you really want? What, what's about you? I never even thought about that because it was so far from my mind in terms of completely impossible. And now 
I'm live with you on this video cast, also podcast. I've done many others. I'm having my own TV station, a TV channel. It's like, yeah, this is actually where I want to be. But again, there was no plan for it. I just had to be open with myself and put some really good people around me. Um, and you should do the same. Whoever's listening to this or watching this, if you're not quite satisfied where you are in your life, um, reach out and speak to people. I've probably gone through like half a dozen coaches in the last two years. And I've, all got, I've got something from all of them. And I'm friends with all of them still. And I'd recommend people to, to go to these people. But it's finding one that works with you on like 85% of the time, 90% of the time. Mm. And um, you have to go through them. And, you know, you go through school, you're coached every day by teachers. It might be an instructional coaching, but there's someone there for you. You go through your, your childhood. Hopefully there's a parent or two parents there for you. He looked after as soon as you leave the nest, as soon as you leave education, boom, you're on your own. And, and how many people, let's say, if you leave, let's say you leave the home at 22, 23 years old. So you've gone away, gone to university, you've come back for a year to live with your parents, raise some cash before you go and move out or what have you not, and you've got a job, how, and, and you stop the parents being right there. There's no education anymore. You're in the workplace. Wow, that's been like 22 years of something in your life, now gone. And people don't go for coaches or consultants. They don't put people around them. They don't think that way. And we're not taught to think that way. If mm. only I was. If only I was. And hopefully I can help other people um, just be a little bit more um, open-minded to that. Because I was lost. from Certainly from the age of, with me, the, all right, my parents were there until my early 20s. They still are there. But in terms of having guidance, proper guidance, and no disrespect to my parents, they the, weren't the ones to give it to me. They loved me, they take care of me, they put a roof over my head, they fed me, put me in clothes, and, and all the rest of it, and looked after me. But in terms of like a role model, move me forward, and what have you not, the last time I had that, I was, I was 11. Mm -hmm. I was 11 years old. And then I didn't pick it up again until, really, I was about 41. 30, 30 years without actually wanting to go to somebody or wanting to learn from, okay, I went to uni, but it's not the same. It's, it's because you, you almost go to university for a process to get that degree and, and what have you not. I'm talking about people around you that, that take a positive and active interest in you, who mm -hmm. phone you up and say, hey, David, what are you doing today? What are you doing tomorrow? What's the goal for the end of the week? And I have that now, and I make more progress now than I ever have. And I say progress, I'm not just talking about money in the bank. I'm talking about engaging with cool guys like you and the stuff that you do. You know, that's progress for me mm -hmm. because I get to share my story. I get to hear your story. I'm listening to what, what you do. You're, you know, you're on Dad's Army. You are. You're hashtag Dad's Army, and 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 it's nice for me. It's great for me to come into contact with people like yourself and other people so whoever's listening to this whoever's watching this right now please just put a fantastic team around you people mm -hmm. that care for you and it can be family but i really think that we need to invest outside of the family as well and yeah. if you've got no money if you've got no money right now i promise you there are people learning coaching today that are actually looking for you where they say look i want to be a coach and i'm practicing being a coach but i don't really have the confidence to charge you and i don't want to charge you yet and you're going, well, I don't have any money anyway. Can we, can we work together? Um, uh, so the free resources exist out there. You don't have to go and spend um, $1,000 a month or $2,000 a month on a coach or a mentor. I mean, you can, and you, you, know, you get different types of uh, uh, support coming your way. But please put people around you and let it open up your life. And if you've got problems in your life, uh, be honest with yourself. I've got problems in my life. How do I overcome that? What do I want? What's mm -hmm. important for me? And when you're a dad, and you know this, when you're a dad, you think to yourself, not just what's important for me, but how does that positively affect the, uh, the, the life of my children? Exactly. What, what, how, how do I want to lead it? And I, you're the sort of guy to have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'm sure you have. Yeah. Um, and in it, one of the first chapters, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, I can't really pronounce his name, um, he talks about 
um, our children on, I can't quite get my words out here, but you'll understand. They will only ever really be on average a 20% better than you. So whatever that is, whether that's a monetary value, whether that's good at something, your children tend to be better than you because they, they, they learn your skills, but only like an extra 20%. And I'm thinking, damn, that's not enough. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, I want my son to be 10 times better than me. How do I do that? So I can do that in two ways. One, improve myself. Because every time I improve myself by one point, it improves him by 1.2. Right? Yeah. That's, that's how I see it. And also to be actively thinking about him so he can see opportunities, so he can see where he wants to go, to give him direction, allow him to make his choices, but there to be more supportive and a little bit more focused on how he can fit into this world. And schools don't do that, you know. Schools, schools are there and, and, and they work really hard, but they train you up to get a job, you know. But schools are 30 years out of date, in my opinion, because our economies are changing. The whole world is changing. And to me, it's not about a job now, it's about survival. And, and I don't think our schools equip us uh, uh, to survive. And I have to do that for my son, you know? And um, that's how I feel about it. As you can see, I could talk all day about it. I feel quite passionate on it. <laughs> that's quite all right, man. Well, we don't have all day. We got we have an hour reserve. Let's go, man. I love, I love listening to you. I appreciate that. Uh, your message, again, very, very important. Uh, we actually kind of have a similar story in regards to finally finding that mentor that just makes us go boom. I bought mine two years ago, Niji Sobo. Absolutely insane journey I've been on ever since that. I actually moved on now to a new coach that I'm starting with actually today. So I'm really excited. And cool. that's what it's all about. And yeah, I never knew. I never knew. Like you're saying, like, you know, you never done it, you, you never found one, but it's like, if you don't know, if nobody actually taught you that, right? No. Then you look no, for that, but that's not in your head. Yeah, you're right. And in fact, you look at, if you look, if you read the press, you look at the papers and you see, and if you're not into this and you see somebody who's a life coach, you think, life coach, why do I need a life coach? I can, I can walk around town, okay? Oh, we completely don't get it. We completely miss it. Um, mm. And, I think somebody I've been needs to, who you really trust, gently introduce it to you and you can see the benefits in their life or something really needs to smack you in the face, yeah. which is the route I went down. And yeah. um, I, got, I got smacked in the face a few times before I had to realise, you know, I need to do this. Life just kept on coming up with this baseball bat or cricket bat, whichever country <laughs> you're in. And um, I, I like David. Take some more punishment before you go out and get a coach. And learn <laughs> properly, <laughs> don't do, don't, 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 don't follow me. <laughs> don't, do, don't, don't do that. It's not good. No, no, no. I absolutely agree with you there. Yep. And life tends to have a big, big, big baseball bat until you finally wake up. So <laughs> <laughs> it does. Uh, it, it, it repeats its patterns because we, we, you know, from a societal point of view, if you. If, if you look into sociology and things like that and, you know, the history of humankind, we create cycles um, from a, a psychological point of view internally and we're affected by the society around us. Things repeat, just like recessions repeat, you know, every seven or eight years or, you know, give or take what, what it is. And it's recognizing that pattern, what's happening in your life. And I could never have recognized that pattern. I needed to speak to somebody sit on the virtual couch everything was done over zoom and skype but sit on the virtual uh, couch and for rob to say to me do you, do you realize you've just given me five different stories but all with the same theme running all the way through like have i <laughs> yeah go back and look at it and I, so i have all right okay then david so what happens next i'm like well i'm kind of making a mistake there oh no this is just keep on happening to me i don't recognize it but you know now i do yeah. um and oh. you need that person to just to they, they they've got to have been on a journey as well you know to, and mm -hmm. to, it's it's not just a i know a lot of coaches they talk about asking questions and uh, what have you not and they're, they're the tools of the trade but you know a real coach the gel that's in it i think it's a coach come mentor where they have taken some of your journey because there are plenty of people out there can ask me some great questions that can get me to open up but with Rob Yates um, 
he's been on a similar journey. He's an English guy. He's a year younger than me, I think, even though I call him my dad. <laughs> he's <a year> younger. <laughs> it's like the, it's like the king of wisdom is Rob. Um, so Sweet. we're English. We both, we both live abroad. We, we both, uh, uh, married ladies who are not English. We both mm-hmm. work online. We both work on business. We both work in a consultancy type of thing. We've both had businesses that haven't reached the heights that we want, wanted to reach. Um, but Rob's been far more successful at I have, than I have. Mm-hmm. But we've got this pattern that I can work to and understand him. And for me, that's the gel of it. So if you're going to look for a coach, yeah, you can get a coaching book, read some coaching questions and work on yourself. And I think you should do that. You can go out and get a coach who can help you still. But if you can find somebody that's been on a similar path, I just think it's that hidden ingredient. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's why actually, come to think about it, both my coaches are dadpreneurs as I am. And as you said, they're yeah. just ahead of me, but going through that journey as well. And that's what yeah. makes it makes you click and that's what is important and that's great advice as well for those of you other dadpreneurs that are listening right now and thinking like okay yeah that coaching thing that sounds nice but how do i go about finding the right coach well exactly that just find somebody that's on the same journey as you he just one step two steps maybe three steps if you can't afford it five steps ahead of you and go with it right so yeah there's there's plenty on facebook and linkedin and stuff like that and i would avoid jumping in on the discovery call straight away and get upselled into buying their training. Um, with Rob, he actually stalked me because he has a product that he, he sells for, for coaching, dadpreneurs. Um, he doesn't use that. It's a little bit different. Uh, his niche is slightly different. But he said, David, I want to work with you because you have this lifestyle. You're this English guy that walks past this every day. And if you're on the podcast, by the way, I'm just showing the, the, the Hennessy behind me. He said, so many people want what you've got and I want to work with you. So he actually stalked me. He understood me first. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but you don't always get that. So any dads, so even mums, if you're listening um, and you want to go and find a coach, find out who they're working with, you know, Uh, if you can, it's not always possible. Find out their message. Does their message resonate with you? Does it mean something with you? Does it, does their journey mean anything? And, you know, start to follow them on Facebook or LinkedIn where you can ask them questions. So you go, hey, Klaus, so um, I've got this issue in my life right now. What do you think to that? And see what their response is. And, you know, and pick somebody you like the look of. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, for me, I would, I would struggle to work with uh, a 19-year-old guy. So, in fact, and he must be about 19. He contacted me last week, wanted to do something with me in marketing and business development wanted me to buy his products now he could be a great guy and he might have the best products in the world but i'm gonna have questions that he won't be able to answer and that Mm. no disrespect to him is purely based on life experience and maturity and and we find ourselves attack um we find ourselves wanting to align ourselves to people who are similar to us and it doesn't mean that you can't find a coach that's completely chalk and cheese to you but uh, for me Somebody who's aged between, I don't know, 38 and 50 in business, English, um, would do the trick. Mm-hmm. And it just, it, 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 it just so happened. But go out there and, and, and try them and test them. And I've made some really good friends. And don't mind our name drop. Um, two years ago, I did a conference in England for driving instructors. I had like 268 people come along. And uh, the conferences in England for driving instructors, are uh, when they get the speakers on, Everybody's from inside the industry. I'm not like that. I'm like, right, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to have these speakers, but you would have never heard any of them, and they're all going to bring something different to you. So I had a lady called Shirley Palmer, uh, English girl. Um, doesn't quite fit with me in terms of where I want to be on my path, but fits with so many other people, and she brings so much to the table. And I've seen her, I've seen her crowd and the amount of people that want to follow her. Um, but they fit with her, and they do tend to be ladies. Mm-hmm. Then there's Cool Mahay. Um, Cole used to be the senior policeman for Nottinghamshire. So, you know, you've got like states like Texas and Arkansas, and, um, I say Arkansas, Texas and uh, Massachusetts and what have you not. Imagine Nottinghamshire as a state department, you know? And mm-hmm. it was a um, state of, it was the Derbyshire. He was the head policeman in that. And he, he finished all of that and he's got his new career of coaching and enlightenment and what have you not. Great guy. Worked with him for a little bit. 
keep in touch with him every now and again. He gets a little bit from me. I get a little bit from him. But still wasn't quite the right fit. Mm -hmm. Then another wonderful, wonderful guy called David Heiner. Um, he's a broadcaster. He's a coach. He believes in something called massive goals, rhino goals. Doesn't do smart goals. Doesn't like those. Wants you to go all out. And uh, H-Y-N-E-R, David Heiner uh, uh, Klaus is hilarious. He's a really, really funny guy. And we are a good fit. We are absolutely, we're absolutely a very good fit. But for some reason, that we didn't really go down the coaching route together. For some reason, we didn't do that. Um, somebody out there in the big wide world might tell me why in the future. But then, you know, Rob came along. I'm like, oh, if only I knew you at school, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so go out, experiment. Um, and for those that are listening, speak to, this, speak to Klaus and say, hey, you know what? This is who I am. What can you do for me? Mm -hmm. and, you might, and you might say to them, well, I can't help you because your situation might be too different. Or you might be able to say, look, I can help you, but I can only help you so far because this mm -hmm. is what you're good at and this is what you need. A coach doesn't have to be all-encompassing. And, you know, it's, um, it's the, 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 when you get into a coach, they don't have to be with you for the next five or ten years. They could just be with you for the next five or ten weeks. Yep. And that's Five fine. Minutes. And that's fine. Yeah. Or maybe that one conversation, right? I mean. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've had that happen as well. One guy needed help. I had one conversation. I helped him. He's like, great. What else can you do? I said, I can't help you anymore. <laughs> you got to find somebody else that's way ahead of me. Yeah. It happens. But I think that also what you just said is what makes a good coach. The coach is honest. He's not just looking for like, okay, what, what, how much money can David bring to my pocket? It's more like, okay, what can I yeah. bring to David to make him successful in his work? And if I find out that I can't, you know, you just named a couple of others, you'll be like, okay, hey, why didn't you, uh, David, you said, right, David Heiner, why didn't you check out him? Yeah. And because I think that exactly what you mentioned is what it is. And, and that's what I've seen from the guys that I've had, I have been coaching with so far. It's like, look, I can help you with this and this and this. I can help you with that. But, you know, we're going to have this guy come in as well because he's a better business coach or he's a better dad coach or whatever it is, right? Husband coach, relationship coach, whatever, whatever is necessary at that moment, right? So I really appreciate you sharing yeah. that. Oh, you're uh, welcome. I have uh, another question because you mentioned something very important. It's like, look, somebody, I, I, I read the book twice now the book that you mentioned from robert kiyosaki um however the whole 20 percent thing i've never <laughs> never stuck with me for some reason so in that regards right it's so important that we are our son's hero and i always keep reminding every single day you are already your son's yeah. hero no matter what you do who you are etc but you clearly seem to be the guy that wants to be the biggest the baddest the the best superhero or hero that you can be for your uh, for your son right so what are some of the things that you specifically do to make sure that every day you just come you know your superpower comes out and you're just that bad superhero you can be for your son well thanks for asking me the world's hardest question i appreciate that um <laughs> i think the secret though is actually in the words that you used and as I'm going, to re I'm going to change those words slightly. You're not in competition with other dads. You're, mm -hmm. trying, to be the you're trying to be the best version of you. Mm -hmm. So if I could be the best version of me, that cascades down into my son. Sure, I need to give him time. I need to give him attention. I need to listen to him. I need to get down and play with him. Um, one of the things that came out the other day from his psychologist uh, was the fact that he's, he's very routine-driven. Uh, I'm not, my wife is, and we need to try and break that out slightly. So, you know, we mentioned about going to coaches and stuff like that. So, you know, why can't you actually have a coach look at your relationship between you and your son or you, or you and your daughter and, um, and, and let them have a look at things? Um, because then you'll take an awful lot from that and, and stuff you're missing. And actually, I get that. I get that, I get that from Rob Yates. I mean, I speak to Rob certainly once a week as a bare minimum as absolute bare minimum it's probably three times a week we talk mm -hmm. and um he, he knows all about my family he knows all about my son and, and, and everything that's going off and that's great because 
he's then in this position where he can ask me questions about certain things which will correct my thinking, which will make me sharper, which will keep me on the ball. But two things I'd like to mention, though, that are about me that helps him. So if I mm-hmm. can help me, I can help him. Look after number one first. So in the morning, every morning, without exception, even this morning when I woke up with a slightly bit of a hangover, um, <laughs> because uh, there's a big party going on in, in, in town this weekend. Um, in the morning, I wake up to myself, I wake up and I, and I say to myself in my head, uh, my name's David Poole and I'm a happy person. And it's just started to set the day off right. I'm not even out of bed at that point. I wake up and I go, all right, you're awake. There's consciousness. We've got a day on today. And a lot of people, what they do is they put their slippers on or go to the toilet or go and put a coffee on and, and just with their head down, pottering around the house and just doing some basic chores to wake themselves up as we do, break, make the breakfast and, and what have you not. But the first thing I do is I just say to myself, I'm David Poole and I'm a happy person. And that helps me um, mm-hmm. because it, it's telling me that I'm a happy person and I believe it. And I, I, I am. Um, the other thing is uh, I changed the, I, ch- I wanted to address the balance with the word OK. Because uh, I have a lot of friends, and you hear this all the time. So your friends hit you up on WhatsApp. Two friends in particular, uh, uh, John and Chris. I've known them for since I was 18, 19 years old sort of thing. So 25 years. So they hit me up on WhatsApp or Facebook Live, and they go, Hey, David, how you doing? Are you okay? And of course, I'm going, yeah, I'm okay. And one day I realized, I thought, hell no, I'm not okay. Okay is five out of ten. It's average. It is bang slap in the middle. I don't want to be okay. I don't want to be a five out of ten because a five out of ten is a failure. So I changed my okay. Now you can change your okay to whatever you want, but I changed my okay, my average, to seven out of ten. So when I wake up in the morning, I go, hey, my name is David Paul and I'm a happy person. And also going, right, I'm all right. I've I've woken up and and, and I'm starting at a seven because I've only just woken up and nothing else has happened to me in my life today, but I'm a seven out of ten right now. That's my okay standard. And if anything comes along in my life and hits me in between the eyes that I can't control, and that's important, I, stuff that I can't control, I go, right, okay, so something's happened that I can't control. I'm now feeling a five out of 10. What can I do in my life that I can control that can bring me back up to at least a seven? My, my aim is to get to a 10, you know, but to at least a seven. So to answer your question in terms of what do I do with my son every day that helps me be the, the best version of who I am, like the, um, his superhero, is to look after myself. And if I look after myself in a good, positive way, where that has a knock-on effect to look after my son, that's great. Because I, you, you can't look after anybody else if you don't know how to look after yourself. Mm-hmm. And the second piece of advice is to actually bring somebody in. It doesn't have to be a psychotherapist. Then. It can literally be a coach. And if you've got a coach right now, you can say, hey, you know what? Can I speak to you about my son? Can I speak to you about my daughter? Coach is going to go, yeah, sure, what's up? I say, well, you know, I just want to have a different opinion on things and stuff like that. (coughs) And actually, your coach, um, as I mean, having children, many many of us have got children, sadly. (laughs) Many of us us have got children. So, you know, if your coach has got children and what have you not, um, they'd probably be a really good foil uh, uh, just to speak to them about uh, your challenges with your children and uh, how you make uh, how you make progress with your life and uh, yeah that's that's what i'd say to you get get a third get a, uh, uh, a third party point of view and you know if your child's ill it's like your cure and prevention thing uh, where, when they're ill where'd you take them to they go to the doctor right mm-hmm. or, you, or if it's worse you take them to the hospital that's cure okay that's a medical illness typically unless they've broken their arm or something that's a medical illness so you're looking to cure them, but you need that third party. But what about well-being? Mm-hmm. Right? Do we want do we want to cure it in terms of sorting them out down down the down the road? Or can we put fantastic measures in right now and look at them that way? So that's the best way for me to answer your question. Absolutely. Love it. Reminded me immediately of Andy Cope, also English. Uh, he's actually the only doctor of happiness. In England, right? That's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll send some information about him. Um, he, he does some great stuff, and this interview with him is absolutely mind-blowing, and we'll get you some great questions as well. I love that. I, 
I used to know a guy called Andy Cope. He was into all this kind of stuff. He was at university. He wasn't based in the East Midlands, Nottingham sort of Derby sort of area, is he? You're, you're Andy. Dude, man, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll connect after that with uh, when we finish with the live interview. I just want to mention that you know it's so important for people to do such things early in the morning. You get up and you immediately get into yeah. your own head and say, Look, "I am a happy person. I always make myself smile," which in the beginning was absolute ridiculous. Yeah. But you know, while he's like, and then just that smile already triggers you. Like, yes, it's going to be another fantastic yeah. day. So I love that. Uh, so I appreciate that. Look, man, it's been an hour. It's flew by. Wow. I think this has been, <laughs> yep, it has. And <laughs> the live interview where I've asked the least of what I want to talk about. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. It was absolutely amazing. I love what we talked about. Dude, uh, okay. thank you so much for being on. Um, others that have questions for you or want to connect with you besides the website that is still active right now, um, what are other awesome. ways for people to, to connect with you? Get me straight on Facebook. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm your friend. I'm your friend on Facebook. So easy to find. Um, I'm trying to think of my handle, actually. Um, I'm not sure if I changed it or not. It used to be facebook.com. David Paul is a football genius. But oh, I, really? I, think I, might, I think I might have changed that now to um, Dyslexic Adventure or something like that. But no, David Paul, P-O-O-L-E. Find me through your friends list. Or you can just type in David Paul Cognac, C-O-G-N-A-C on Facebook. Boom, and there I am. And there you go. Okay, well, for the people that are listening right now, here's the link. And you can just check it out. For the people that are, have been listening to the replay, the link to David's profile will be in the description. So you can just click on it and connect with him. Oh, uh, I can tell you right now, he will respond because he has done so with me. And it was absolutely great. So I highly recommend that. Anyway, everybody, thank you so much for being with us. David, again, thank you so thank much you. for coming and sharing so openly your story with us. And I wish everybody a great day. David, give me a second when we're done, okay? I just want to – I got a couple more questions for you before we, uh, we go. Everybody else, talk to okay. you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for your time. Bye. Are you still meeting up with your friends now that you're a father? Kids making you stress out. You got no time for yourself to work out read or relax can you still remember the time you were hanging out with your friends feeling energetic happy and confident spending time together and talking about your life and your crazy dreams you're feeling alone now don't you no one to share your challenges with and you're just running around from one storm into the next well it's time to change this now Join me and the Brotherhood of Fearless Fathers to speak on a weekly basis with like-minded dads to crush your challenges, face your fears with determination, be held accountable and regain control of your life. If you want to become the hero your family needs you to be, then go to becomeafearlessfather.com brotherhood. Looking forward to seeing you on one of our next calls.